So thank you all again for joining us tonight for our Tough Topics discussion. The Tough Topics series was created to provide a safe space to discuss topics that you may be afraid to ask questions about. As librarians, we are here to help, not to judge. This year, Shreve Memorial Library partnered with the Louisiana Department of Health Office of Public Health Region 7 to provide a series of tough topic discussions related to opioid addiction and substance abuse. And tonight for our final presentation, we have Yolanda Duckworth, Region 7 Opioid Preparedness Outreach Coordinator from uh, Louisiana Department of Health, and she will provide us an overview of Louisiana's Opioid Preparedness Plan. Now, before we begin, I'd like to encourage you to complete the pre-presentation survey. Again, the link can be found in the chat box. Also, I'd like to remind you to please keep your screens on mute and submit any questions that you may have through the chat box feature. Now, without further ado, I will turn it over to Yolanda. Well, good evening. Thank you, Samantha. Thank you all for um, signing on tonight. Um, as Samantha mentioned, I am the last presenter. Um, we've had a wonderful month of opioid education um, with various topics and various speakers. And so tonight we're culminating um, that public education and informational partnership with the Shreve Memorial Library with our presentation tonight. So if you don't mind, give me one moment and I will share my screen and we can get started. Let's see, are we sharing, Samantha? Yes, you are sharing, but it's showing your Zoom page. It's not showing your uh, PowerPoint presentation just yet. Okay. There it is. Okay, I believe we're ready. All right, well, thank you very much. Um, tonight's topic is entitled Helping Communities Impacted by the Opioid Epidemic. Um, I cover an area of Northwest Louisiana, uh, which is Region 7, um, according to the Louisiana Department of Health. And those areas, uh, parishes are Bossier, Caddo, Bienville, Claiborne, DeSoto, Natchitoches, Sabine, Red River, and Webster Parishes. And I keep getting this little notice here at the bottom, but maybe it'll go away. Okay, so tonight's learning objectives are to raise awareness of the opioid crisis in the U.S. and Louisiana, to identify opioid misuse and discuss its effects, to understand strategies to prevent opioid misuse, to expand our knowledge of diversion, safe disposal and storage of opioids in our homes, and to describe the role that the Office of Public Health Program and community collaboratives um, are doing to educate the community on opioid use disorder, OUD. So who we are and why are we here? Um, and the we would be the Louisiana Department of Health, the Office of Public Health, and the Bureau of Community Preparedness. Our roles are to raise awareness of the opioid crisis, to help communities um, to prevent incidents of deaths of opioid um, disorders, to identify and coordinate local resources, for healthcare providers, communities, uh, as well as residents in our region to offer awareness and support to the community residents on recognizing the signs and the symptoms of opioid overdose and to educate communities and residents on how to obtain life-saving care to stop an opioid, potentially uh, stop an opioid overdose. So prescription drug use remains a state and national epidemic. Drug overdose deaths primarily from prescription medications is the leading cause of accidental death 
in the United States, more than even car crashes. Clearly, misusing prescription medications can be harmful to our health, but prescription drugs are among the, among the most misused substance in the U.S., more so than illicit or street drugs. The most commonly misused prescription drugs include opioid pain medications, sedatives, and stimulants. We'll dig a little deeper um, as we go along in the presentation. So what are opioids? Opioids are medications that act on parts of the brain that control pain. Um, they also affect the area of the brain that control breathing. Um, during an opioid overdose, breathing is compromised. It can be slowed or it can stop. And in, uh, oftentimes in cases, a person can become unconscious, uh, go into a coma, and worst case scenario, death can happen. So most opioids are derived from um, the familiar poppy plant, um, derived from opium. And um, the common derivatives of the poppy plant, the uh, opium, um, are morphine, codeine, oxycodone, and heroin. We'll talk a little more about those as well as we go along. So according to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, a national data source reported that 74% drug overdose in the U.S. involved opioids, 74%. More than 72,000 individuals died of drug overdose in the U.S. And more than 73% of those opioid-involved um, overdose deaths involve synthetic opioid like fentanyl. An average of 130 Americans die every day of an opioid overdose. In 2018, 2 million people had an opi opioid um, use disorder, OUD is what I'll refer to it as. Um, over 808,000 people used heroin. And we'll look at a little more of each of these a, a little uh, farther along. 47,600 people died from overdosing and opioids staggering numbers. And these were all reported in the year 20, between 2018 and 2019. So common types of opioids, I kind of alluded to them a little earlier, um, but most common opioid types are narco, hydrocodone, which is commonly known for, oxycodone, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, oxycotton, oxycodone is another name for it, tramadol, fentanyl, codeine, morphine, and heroin. Now here are some street names um, that we've uh, come to uh, know. And the reason I have this slide uh, included is because we, we have children in our lives. We know children. Um, children use um, their own language when communicating with one another. So it's important for us as adults to be aware of these names. So if they happen to come, uh, happen to come up in a conversation that is with another young person, we can, you know, be more attentive and try to uh, listen more um, to exactly what they're saying. So just a few of them here, um, and you may have heard of some of these. Um, as I uh, present these talks to different uh, demographics, um, different populations, um, this list continues to um, add new names to it. Um, meth, I think we, we all have heard of meth. Um, now, this one, um, okay, so I have pancakes and syrup but the most commonly used word uh, regarding an opioid um, is, it's a special way that kids pronounce this word, but I pronounce it syrup. So you probably know the way that they pronounce it, but um, that's a commonly um, talked about uh, opioid. 
among young the young population. Also Tootsie Roll and um, Monkey. But all of these are um, street names that um, users and um, even a lot of non-users know and understand what they mean. In Louisiana in the year 2019, last year, 588 deaths involving opioids happened. So that's 588 souls that lost their lives to misuse, overuse, and succumb to um, opioid use disorder. Opioid involved deaths between the years 2012 and 2019 are, are pretty um, staggering uh, looking at this chart. And just as a side note, um, this graph is provided by the Louisiana Opioid Surveillance Program, the Office of Public Health Bureau of Health Informatics. Um, you can visit their website uh, for short, it's called, we call it LODS. Um, you can visit the website and it will give you a wealth of information on different um, related um, opioids, different parishes. Um, it, it gives a wealth of information that can specifically meet your informational needs. And that web address is www dot l o d s s dot l a i'm sorry l d h dot l a dot gov i'll repeat that www dot l o d s s dot l d h dot l a dot gov this chart represents the opioid involved deaths in the state of louisiana by parish opioid involved deaths is a distinction we use in surveillance because it includes traditional overdose poisoning primary cause of death, but also it includes other deaths not marked as drug poisoning, but where coroners determined that opioid contributed to the person's death. Opioid involved death in Louisiana increased by 25% from 470 in 2018 to 588 in 2019. That's a 267% increase, very significant. Both drug overdose and opioid overdose deaths have been consistently increasing. The important takeaway from this graph um, shows that um, opioid involved deaths are increasing higher in a higher rate than all involved drug deaths. And this is a graph um, showing our region, region seven, um, the um, Darker uh, blue shaded um, area is Caddo Parish. And um, in 2019, there were eight deaths uh, that the coroner reported that were opioid related. And the shaded parishes, Red River, uh, DeSoto, Claiborne, Bossier, those um, indicate, the shaded area indicates that those deaths were less than five. Now, the reason that I know that they were definitely less than five. I um, did an investigation and was able to get from vital um, statistics in New Orleans, the exact number of coroner um, claims, claim deaths from those parishes. Now, although this number may look minimal, um, relatively speaking, um, the opioid epidemic um, is um, viewed as a whole. And so whereas in the northern part of the state, northwestern part of the state, we have less reported um, opioid involved deaths, other parts of the state is not so fortunate. For instance, the southern part of the state has a much higher um, rate of death, of opioid related death than the northern part of the state. But I wanted to um, show this just to let you know that opioid, um, the opioid epidemic is not isolated. It's, it's a state issue. Um, 
And this graph shows that. So as, as I alluded to, the opioid epidemic affects all of us. Um, the, um, it doesn't matter whether you're older adult, teens, school age youths, college students, professionals, there is no stereotypical or type, quote, type of person um, that is um, susceptible to uh, prescription drug misuse. Prescription drug misuse occurs when, when very, to the very young and to the very old. Um, 6.5 million Americans aged 12 and older reported misusing a prescription medication in the past month. And this was according to a national survey done by the National Survey on Drug Use and Health in 2014. Two thirds of teens that report misuse prescription of uh, for opioid pain medications, state that they receive this medication from friends or family members. How many of you have ever shared uh, prescriptions or, or medications, say for something as, as mild as a headache? Most, most people have, most of us have at some point, but to know better is to do better, right? So um, sharing prescriptions is never okay. And um, so much so it can lead to an addiction. Um, SAMHSA, um, Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration estimates that the number of senior citizens requiring substance misuse treatment in 2020 will increase by 4.4 million since 2003 which was um, a, an increase of 1.7 million. Current research estimates that 17% of senior citizens struggle with a substance misuse problem. And why do you think that is? Um, because the older you get, uh, the more frail we get. That's just a fact of life. And so um, if there's not a caregiver um, available to help uh, that senior monitor their medication, they may accidentally um, misuse it um, and possibly overdose from it. Um, so that's why we need to be very, you know, um, proactive with monitoring our seniors and making sure that they're taking their medications correctly, as well as younger um, persons as well. But um, the epidemic has cost our country $78.5 billion a year. This is um, an outrageous number, um, but it covers different areas of our economy. It covers under healthcare, loss of productivity at work, um, addiction treatment, and of course the criminal justice system. So let's talk about opioid misuse, or is it an opioid addiction? So in essence, if someone has a physical dependence, they don't always necessarily have an addiction, but it can contribute to it. Individuals that misuse opioids are not always addicted. They could just be misusing the opioids. So misuse refers to utilization in a manner other than what it was prescribed. An opioid addiction, OUD, occurs when attempts to cut down or control use are unsuccessful or when use results in social problems and a failure to fulfill obligations at work or school not completed. Opioid addiction often comes after the person has developed opioid tolerance and dependence, making it physically challenging to stop using the drug. So here's some other information on um, OUD. It's a pattern of opioid use characterized by tolerance, cravings, inability to control the usage, and the continuance of using the drug despite any consequences, uh, jail or loss of employment. 
Um, it involves compulsive or uncontrolled use of one or more substance. So mixed with alcohol or tobacco or marijuana, um, an opioid use can easily um, occur. Um, it's self-medication, self-medicating gone wrong. How many of us know people who say, oh gosh, you know, it's, this shoulder hurts. So, you know, I've got these old um, prescriptions, these lore tabs here, I, I'm going to, and they've been there for a year. I'm going to take, you know, a couple of these and, and you know, the pain should go away. That's self-medicating. Um, OUD is treatable, but it, it has to be managed properly with sometimes with medication, behavioral therapy, and of course, uh, recovery support. More quick facts um, about OUD. Some people will become addicted after taking opioids for only five days. Approximately 80% of opioid emergencies from overdoses are deemed accidental. People are not, you know, intentionally trying to die. Um, it's the addiction and the misuse of those medications that are causing those either overdoses or those accidental deaths. Roughly 21 to 29% of patients prescribed opioids for chronic pain misuse them. Um, and we have some remedies to that, that the state legislature, we'll talk about that a little later, um, is helping um, the medical community to help overcome this issue and this problem. Between eight and 12% developed an opioid use disorder, an estimated four to 6% who misuse prescription opioid transition to a, a harder drug like heroin. About 80% of people who use heroin first misuse prescription opioids. So let's talk about some signs because we need to know what um, an addiction, an opioid addiction looks like. So it would be uncontrollable cravings of, of the drug or drugs. Um, drowsiness, changes in sleep patterns, isolation from friends, family, and activities um, that the person um, used to love to participate in, frequent flu-like symptoms, um, runny nose, those kinds of things, lack of hygiene, not paying close attention to um, personal care, and weight loss. Opioid trigger, the release of endorphins, your brain feel, that's the, the brain's feel-good system. Endorphins muffle your perception of pain and boost feelings of pleasure, creating a temporary but powerful sense of well-being. When an opioid dose wears off, you may find, a person may find themselves wanting um, those feel-good feelings to come back and to come back quickly. Um, this is the first milestone possibly on a path toward a potential addiction. Additional addition, uh, addiction factors to consider are high risk environment. So if you live in an environment where people, you know, are using um, or misusing opioids or other types of drugs and alcohol, um, that increases your risk factor. Uh, the younger you are, the higher your risk factor are. Um, unemployment uh, stands to be a risk factor in becoming addicted. Uh, having a prior substance um, misuse history and a history of tobacco use and having a high level of stress and mental disorders, all are factors in increasing a person's addiction to opioids. So if a person is overdosing, how will you know? Yeah. I, I mean, how, how would you know? Well, here are some um, points that you can um, now identify if by chance um, you are in the presence of a person 
who is experiencing an opioid overdose. So their their pimple, excuse me, their pupils um, have a pinpoint um, look to them. Um, sometimes the eyes are glassy, um, but it's not their normal. And if they're a stranger, the, the same glassy uh, pinpoint pointed pupil look will still be there. Um, slowed or shallow breathing, their body will become limp. Um, this choking and gurgling sound, they'll start. Um, their skin will become pale, uh, bluish. Uh, their skin to the touch will be cold. Their fingertips will also uh, have a bluish color to them and they can lose consciousness. The Louisiana's approach to combat the opioid epidemic are these, um, to offer safe, effective, non-addictive strategies to manage chronic pain. And we'll talk about each of these in a little more detail. New innovative medication assistant treatment program, which is also called MAT, um, using methadone, buprenorphine, and uh, naltro naltroxone. Um, these are different um, treatments for opioid use disorder and also alcohol as well. Improved overdose prevention and reversal intervention through the medication Narcan and the PMP program, the prescription monitoring program that was um, presented by the legislator, le legislature and is currently um, active today. We'll talk more about that as well. And uh, harm reduction, um, that would be strategies uh, from potentially um, someone overdosing accidentally or a child um, getting into a pill bottle and accidentally overdosing. Alternatives for managing pain. That was the first um, effort that the Louisiana um, is working to approach um, the epidemic of opioids. So it's recommended that um, regular exercise um, is a good alternative to managing pain, um, physical and occupational therapy. I know I, I have had a shoulder injury um, years back and I um, was ordered by my physician physical therapy um, along with some pain medication. And um, I, it turned out that the physical therapy was what I needed. Um, the opioids, I, I never, I may have used a couple of them. So these are alternatives. The first go-to for pain should not always be an opiate. Meditation is, is always, always um, a good alternative. Uh, muscle rubs, heat or cold therapy, aspirin, ibuprofen, and uh, anti-inflammatory medications, muscle relaxers, in other words, are all good alternatives for managing pain. And these are alternatives that we're having conversations with um, primary care providers uh, about, and they're, they're really um, being more proactive in adhering to these. So the other is treatment. So the MAT, the Medication Assistant Treatment Program. Remember I mentioned methadone, uh, uh, buprenorphine, Subutex, uh, Suboxone, and Vivitrol are all, um, they have proven to be very effective medication to combat the urge of a person who is addicted to opioids from um, having, um, well, to continuing their drug usage. Um, these medications improve patient survival rates. Uh, it increases uh, retention in their treatment. It decreases their probability of illicit, using illicit uh, opiates um, and possibly being involved in criminal activity. Um, it increases the patient's ability to gain and maintain employment. So if they're sober, they can go to a job and work for eight hours and not nod off or not go into the bathroom and use and then, you know, can't come back to work. 
and to improve birth outcomes uh, among women who have OUD or substance use disorder. Now, th this um, slide indicates the different methods that the legislature has put into place um, working with healthcare providers. The first one is the seven day supply, which limits a first time prescription of opioids to for acute pain to a seven day supply. Now that seven day supply does not mean necessarily one uh, pain medication per day. The doctor will determine what that patient needs, but this is just um, a guide that um, providers use in just making sure that, because some people who are addicted to opioids do doctor shop. And so this is a, a, a method put in place that um, makes it makes the plan feel clear across the board for all providers. There's an advisory council um, made of 13 members uh, um, that come from different aspects of behavioral health, uh, uh, primary care, and other areas that talk about the issues within the state and, and together they come up with um, alternatives or different um, tactics to address those issues. PMP enhancement, that's the um, prescription monitoring program. This law strengthens our prescription monitoring program, including mandated registration for any prescriber. So any, any healthcare provider who is administering um, opioids will register through this program. And it's mandated queries before opioids are prescribed and every 90 days during treatment. So during that time period through this platform, um, that provider um, is monitored by the prescriptions that he or she um, is distributing. Uh, and it also includes continuing education for that provider, just keeping them up to date with the latest and the best practices for um, treating OUD. And then um, the last one, um, the PMP um, applicability. This law broadens the prescription monitoring program, um, making um, the um, Narcan, which we'll talk about a little later, accessible to counselors, parole officers, medical examiners, and coroners. And lastly um, is harm reduction. And it's threefold, um, proper medication storage and disposal methods, the syringe service program, SSP is what it's called for short, and um, naloxone, Narcan, that's the anti-overdosing medication. And we'll talk about each of these individually. They need to be discussed individually. All right, so um, oftentimes when a provider um, gives us a, an opioid for pain. Um, most people have extras um, and we keep them in our medicine cabinet or you know, some, our kitchen cabinet, wherever you, you store um, your go-to med daily medications. Um, this is an easy um, to kind of grasp the importance of a proper disposal of those medications because oftentimes if, you know, it could be a friend or a family member or whomever, especially with seniors, if they know that grandma, you know, is taking two different types of opioids, um, they, you know, can visit more frequently and um, medications can, you know, not be found when they're needed. So these are um, examples of proper disposal once those medications are no longer needed. So to mix the medication, and this is not just for opioids, by the way, this could be for um, outdated vitamins, um, outdated aspirin, any type of medication. So to mix it in um, a substance such as dirt or cat litter, coffee grind, sand, um, and then place it in a plastic bag and then simply throw it away. 
because what we don't want to do is to um, dispense old medications um, in our water system through the sink or the toilet and then contaminate our water supply. But to make sure that the um, information on the bottle, because you want to protect um, your health information, um, either remove the label or darken it with a Sharpie. And then um, there's um, another way to dispose that you know, doesn't involve cat litter or coffee grinds or anything. Uh, most Walgreens, I know all of the Walgreens in Shreveport um, have drop boxes where you can drop off your uh, unused medications, whether they're old or it doesn't matter how old. Um, the Shreveport City Hall has a drop box. Um, State Trooper B has a drop box. The Bienville Courthouse and DeSoto Sheriff Stations all have drop boxes. And there's a website um, just to, for, for your information if you'd like to uh, find out if there's one near you. Um, the web address is https semicolon double black backslash safe pharmacy backslash drug disposal backslash. And I'll repeat that https semicolon double backslash safe pharmacy backslash drug disposal backslash. And um, here's just a list of other um, medications that um, are um, a part of the um, FDA that tells you which medications you can flush and those that you can't. And you can visit drugs at FDA um, for the full list of those drugs and medications. So let's talk about proper storage. Um, again, um, talking about seniors with multiple uh, medications and um, using uh, daily pill boxes to keep their medications in order and to make sure that they take the medications in the proper time frame that they're supposed to. But to use a secure lock for those um, medications such as opioids, because there again, um, if you're having family member coming to visit because opioid um, use disorder, a person with opioid use disorder does not have a particular look. Remember we said there's no stereotype of um, person with uh, an opioid use disorder. So we don't know, but just to protect everyone, it's recommended to keep those medications in a secure place. And most importantly, to keep out of sight of others and children and pets. And to keep track, to count those medications of your loved one and of yourself. Um, I, I've, I've heard stories where um, a family member, an older um, family member, was taking opioids and uh, the first part of the month that prescription is filled, you know, and family members come to visit and that person that, that is, uh, uh, has an opioid use disorder um, knows that and that's a prime time that they can come and um, retrieve those medications unknowingly to the senior. And when using those weekly pill boxes, Note how many remaining pills are in the bottle. 60% of people keep leftover opioids for future use. 20% said that they share their medications and 8% will likely share their medications with a friend while 14% will likely share opioids with a relative. So, keep those medications in its proper place. So the syringe service program, SSP. This program is new to Shreveport, but not new to Louisiana nor um, the United States. Um, 
This program um, is designed to help reduce HIV and STD and other infections. Um, it provides testing, sterile syringes and supplies, and it offers linkage to care and treatment for those seeking help with OUD. And they also provide other information. The Philadelphia Center is our SSP um, uh, outlet here in Northwest Louisiana. And they are located at 2020 Centenary Boulevard. And they are doing an exceptional job at helping individuals with um, substance abuse disorder or opioid use disorder uh, by providing them clean needles in exchange for uncleaned ones, um, tourniquets, um, cookers, uh, providing them HIV testing, and whatever other service that an individual may need when they come um, each week. It's Fridays, um, every Friday, um, to receive that information. They're providing them with whatever um, services that they could possibly need, and oftentimes referring them to other services that they may need. So the anti-opioid overdose medication, Narcan, it, as it's um, typically known, is a reversal for a person who is experiencing an opioid overdose. Um, its only purpose is to reverse the opioid overdose. It's, it cannot harm an individual if that is not if it's given and the person is not experiencing an opioid overdose, um, but its sole purpose is to provide that treatment until 911, the emergency responders can um, come to continue the treatment. And it comes in three different forms. The most popular format is the um, nasal spray. Each container has two administrations to it and um, it is given obviously um, in, in the nostril. Um, and the other is the uh, injection, um, not so popular, um, but it is available. And um, the one that um, I like, um, I, I like them all, but I like this one because it walks you through. It's a vocal, uh, aspect that um, is built into um, the prescription that tells the person pull the tab, um, insert uh, the pen. It walks you through all of the instructions. Now, um, this medication at one time was only given by a prescription, but through the Louisiana legislature, it is now a standing order. So, which means that any person um, whether you um, know someone who has substance use disorder or opioid use disorder, or you are a person with opioid use disorder, can go to any drugstore and ask for the medication, no questions asked, no prescription necessary. And oftentimes um, there's, uh, with certain uh, health plans, there's no copay, there's no out-of-pocket expense. But if there is not um, uh, Medicaid, Medicare, or a private health insurance, there may be a nominal uh, fee charged. But it is accessible at any pharmacy um, in our area. So opioid use disorder um, is very stigmatized, let's just be honest. Um, but it, it could happen to really a, a family member, a friend, um, someone close to us. And so to not use terms that will cause a person not to seek treatment, um, not to have um, STD testing, um, it, it's, it's not necessary because there, there are easy terms that we can use that can help a person or encourage a person um, who is struggling with an opioid use disorder to seek that treatment or care that they're needing. So just consider um, using the word addicted and replacing that with 
a person with an addiction. Instead of saying the person has a substance or drug or is a drug user or abuser, how about saying the person um, has a substance use disorder? Instead of saying uh, the person is a former or reformed addict, how about using the phrase this person is a recovering uh, is, is is in recovery or remission? The person has a drug problem or he has a drug habit. Just say the person has a substance use disorder, um, relapse. Instead of saying that word, very stigmatizing, just use the expression, this person is experiencing a reoccurrence in their, in their symptoms. And um, the barriers that just these phrases alone can um, give to a person struggling with an addiction can, um, can either be a life-saving um, one if we use the, the right um, terms, or it, it could send them the other way if we use the more stigmatizing terms. There's help. There's, there's help out there for anyone um, who has an opioid use disorder or substance use disorder. And here are just a list of the few um, that are regional that um, we've put together. Um, 211 is uh, from any phone, whether it's a land phone or a cellular phone, can dial this number and help is on the other end, whatever the issue is, whether it's substance use disorder, homelessness, whatever the issue is. Uh, of course, the Louisiana Department of Health, um, Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, Center for Disease Control and Prevention, the Northwest Louisiana Human Services District, and the Louisiana Opioid Data Surveillance System are all um, services and organizations that um, you can either get more information or you can find more help. So um, as Samantha mentioned, um, there was a pre-survey at the beginning of my uh, presentation um, I hope you all have had an opportunity to complete that. Um, so that one, we wanted to know what you, what your knowledge was about opioid use disorder. And so hopefully after my presentation, your um, informational level um, has increased. And so your post-survey will indicate uh, what you've learned from this presentation. Um, the links are also um, in the chat box, I believe, Samantha, and um, please feel free to uh, complete that survey. So at this time, I will um, open the floor for questions. Thank you all very much for uh, being here tonight. I see that we had um, several others that um, were added on. Uh, welcome, and thank you uh, for being here. So I'll turn it over to you, Samantha. Well, thank you, Yolanda, for this wonderful presentation. I put the post survey link in the chat box. Um, right now, we don't have any questions in the chat box, but if you do have any questions, please feel free to ask them. And I really appreciate you, Yolanda, for working with us to organize these tough topic series this year. Um, and thank you for this presentation tonight. So I'll uh, just give everyone a few more minutes if they'd like to ask a question to go ahead and type that in the chat box or any comments that you have on the Tough Topic series this year. And um, this pre presentation along with the others, Samantha, will be on the library's website? They are gonna be uploaded to our YouTube channel. Okay. So if you go to YouTube and you search Shreve Memorial Library, you'll be able to pull up all of our videos and these are included on a playlist called Tough Topic. Thank you for that. So if you missed any of the previous presentations, they're already uploaded, and this one will be uploaded um, after we end tonight. Thank you, Samantha. Thank you all. Thank you. Uh, we just got a couple of comments that just say, great series, a wealth of information. Thank you, and thanks. I learned so much. So thank, thank you. you all for joining us. Well, if there are no questions, um, please make sure you take a minute to complete that post survey. The link again is in the chat box. And if there's nothing else, everyone else, have a good night and we'll see you Thanks. next time.
Thank you so much. Good night, everybody. Good night.